Hello there, my name's Sadie Watson and I'm a fellowship holder um, hosted by MOLA in London. MOLA are a large contracting organisation, also an educational charity working in the development sector. My colleague Kate and I are working on a project looking at public art, public facing project design in archaeology and it's been really interesting to think about how the current structures that we work within might might allow or restrict that. So this is um, the background to this this paper. At the beginning, it's worth thinking really about how large a sector development led archaeology actually is. You'll see that th these are 2020 numbers. They'll be much higher now because we've had a really difficult couple of years. Despite COVID, we've been really busy. But 97% of the income for the whole archaeological sector comes from um, fees and charging for services. So working for clients on development led projects, whether that is large infrastructure, smaller house builders uh, and everything in between, really. And one of the things that I've been thinking about quite carefully in this um, is who we work for. There are two main issues with, with projects, I think, in the development led sector. It's, it's who we work for, who the clients are, and also the kind of projects that we do. So I, I'm highlighting the Qatari royal family as, um, as a potentially problematic client for various reasons. They've been in the news recently um, for the World Cup, highly problematic World Cup, as we all know. Um, and, and they are a major landowner in the UK now. Um, they have they have infrastructure and urban developments in, in many of the big cities, particularly London. So the Shard is a good example where they funded a development next to a, a public um, railway station, London Bridge, um, because the government don't fund network rail to redevelop the actual building infrastructure of the railways. They only fund them to to repair tracks and things like that. And you could argue whether they do that properly as well, of course. Um, but not only that, they also have the Qatari royal family also have interests in other more local developments. Really, so the Elephant and Castle one is one that's really close to me, and that involved bulldozing of huge social housing estates, replacing them with so-called affordable housing. Um, and the key to this, of course, is that myself and Mola colleagues worked on some of these projects. So uh, we were working at this point for the Qatari royal family. And in terms of what kind of project we might end up working for, this is an example from Kate's neck of the woods, so the Surrey Hills in the south of England, um, where despite lots of appeals, planning was granted for a fracking um, drilling site, non-fracking gas well, sorry, near Dunsfold, near Guildford, um, close to an ANOB in an area of out outstanding natural beauty, obviously next to near the National Park. And the things that will require most archaeological input to this in within the planning system are things like access roads, um, fences, ring, uh, ringing fences that go around the edge of the site, that kind of thing, access routes. Often it's, it's the access route that requires more archaeology than the actual um, damaging aspects of development, in which in this case it's the it's the gas well itself. Now, obviously, the archaeologists involved in this process acted professionally. They, the county archaeologists um, submitted the conditions and the response to the planning application. The people who conducted the desk based assessment um, did that. And the written scheme of investigation will be, if it's not already, will be carried out by equally professional archaeologist colleagues of mine, whether they work for the same company as me or not. Um, I have faith that they'll do a good job. Highly likely that the economic argument will win, of course, and archaeologists will be working on the mitigation, uh, the, ar the archaeological damage of this project, whatever their personal um, politics of, of drilling for gas in, in the south of England might be. And I'm not criticising these professional archaeologists, of course, I'm just using it as an example to illustrate the complexity of the personal ethics and professional obligation and how sometimes they don't match up. It's slightly different, of course, in the museum sector, where um, the lack of government funding for the National Portfolio Museums has meant that these, these museums and other organisations, cultural organisations, seek sponsorship money. So BP is the obvious one. Culture Unstained, um, of course, have done lots of protests about this um, and they've had some major scalps. So some larger organisations have stopped BP sponsorship, National Portrait Gallery, South Bank Centre, BFI, Scottish Ballet, and also large mainstream events like New Scientists Live or um, Edinburgh Science Festival. Um, but there's a there's a sort of backstory to this and behind the logos remind us to think really carefully about the potential of greenwashing and spin and where some aspects of, for example, BP's work um, can actually be uh, not quite what you might think. And one of these examples, of course, is the solar energy sector, which I'm sure we're all, well, I, I'm in favour of renewable energy, of course, 
But of course, one of the major providers and installers of solar projects is LightSource, who are owned by BP. Uh, and this is, um, why is this problematic? I, I find this problematic because this is a kind of, uh, BP are hedging their bets, they're still engaging in oil extraction and uh, the use of fossil fuels, but they're, they're also maintaining a presence uh, and a funding regime on, on renewable energy. And it just seems um, difficult, really, for me, morally and ethically, all this. And for archaeologists specifically, of course, it's it's really difficult because um, we know that we work a lot on these these projects. Renewable energy sector is one of the largest funders of our work, other than infrastructure and housing. Now, in certain parts of the country, Sangir particularly, it's a really growing sector. Um, some of the companies are pretty much working on renewable energy, um, solar energy panel installation sites all the time. And in 2019, um, a report was published, commissioned by Historic England, looking at heritage input into the renewable energy sector. Um, and you can see that solar farms are by far the greatest of these. And as I said, um, East Midlands and Southwest are by far the largest areas where those projects happen as well. So if you work in those areas, you will be working on one of these sites. There are some ways that we can wrestle some of the control away from the clients, though, perhaps um, using some of the existing planning frameworks that we've got. So Section 106 is a good example. Um, it's intended to um, to redistribute some of the wealth, exactly as it says, really. Um, they're legal agreements, contractually binding, placed on a developer by the council. In the, in the event of a development not um, having significant impact to a local area that can't be moderated by means of conditions attached to a planning decision. So we know that the planning frameworks are quite restrictive in terms of innovative um, ways of mitigating damage or harm or community impact. So section 106 is quite often used for this and Southwark Council at the bottom here um, have used section 106 contributions in the past for archaeology. Section 106 is a scene is slightly problematic. Um, they should be one way that developers are encouraged to provide affordable housing or social housing even in their developments. Of course, that rarely happens in major developments such as the Shard. And I mentioned the Shard earlier with reference to who funded that project. Um, there's no social housing or affordable housing in the Shard, as you can well imagine. So the Section 106 money there was used to build housing elsewhere in the same borough. And the community infrastructure levy is another way that um, councils persuade developers to, to contribute funds, really, to central funds that are then held by that planning authority. Um, now, the community infrastructure levy is, uh, and the, um, the levelling up white paper underneath, which my, unfortunately, my film is slightly, is slightly covering up, it says it's a way of, lever of leveraging private investment into community and neighbourhood infrastructure, community activity and wealth building. Obviously, um, this is money that ideally the government, local government and national would, would be financing, but um, in the event of a large development, then then they're persuading the, the developers to do that work for them. Um, the community infrastructure levy is slightly problematic, though, as it's about to be revised or amended in the levelling up bill to incorporate spending on things other than infrastructure. So defined here as social and affordable housing. Um, and you'll see in the news only yesterday that Yvette Cooper MP has, has managed to persuade them, possibly through attrition, I think, um, to include the provision of childcare facilities in, in this infrastructure levy. So it's a really, it can be a really significant lever to, to gain benefit for the local community. But there's always a but with these things. And um, Property Week survey conducted several times since 2017. These are the latest 2020 figures showed that lots of the London councils, particularly, which are the ones that I was looking at, are keeping hold of their Section 106 and their um, community infrastructure levy money. So uh, billions unspent being held in their bank accounts. Um, particularly worrying that Tower Hamlets, who are consistently uh, one of the the most deprived boroughs in the whole country have got all this money in reserve and they're not earmarking it for any particular infrastructure that that is defined currently on their website or anywhere that I could see. Now that there might be reasons for this. Um, one of the reasons is that perhaps they're keeping it for strategic infrastructure such as schools, although there's no evidence for that in Tower Hamlets particularly. Um, it may be that some of the planning authorities are cynically um, keeping the the funds to spend in areas where they know people live that might vote for them in the future. There's always political angles to these decisions, of course, that local local councils make. 
And it may be, of course, that they're inefficient and risk averse and they, they're reluctant to spend this money on innovative, interesting um, community projects. Uh, take your pick as to which one you think is true. In all of this, I, I've been um, talking outwardly. So people that we work for, projects that we work on, I just really need, we need to acknowledge obviously the internal pressures as well. So I'm an employee. I work for a big company who work for these clients. And if I posted on social media, I would be bringing my employer into disrepute. And I, I take that um, that relationship on board as someone who who is an employee. If I was self-employed, I would have an entirely different approach, of course. Um, and the other thing that we have uh, lots of us are members of, of pressure groups, organisations, particularly even archaeologically um, focused ones. Um, I'm not attacking Rescue, particularly here. Rescue, the British Archaeological Trust, have done amazing campaigning work. Um, without them, we, we probably wouldn't have a development-led sector, you could argue. Um, but their support of Stonehenge Alliance, who are against the A303 tunnel at, at Stonehenge um, within the World Heritage Site landscape, um, I found problematic. Uh, I think Stonehenge Alliance are a difficult organisation to support. And I think um, that rescue are, you know, there needs to be an acknowledgement sometimes within these organisations and within the memberships of these organisations that um, you might be against something, but it, you can't uh, assume that your members won't be working on it. Many rescue members will end up working on the Stonehenge A303 tunnelling project if it, if it goes ahead. Um, and I, I also thought I'd be interested to see what scope there is for us in the various professional spheres that we work within. So I looked at my code of conduct as a member of um, Chartered Institute for Archaeologists. And the, in terms of professional ethics, the code of conduct is really largely silent on these issues about client um, client related ethics or project related ethics, preferring to leave their their own influence over ethical behaviour to actual archaeological behaviour. So I might work for a highly problematic client on a highly problematic project. But as long as I behave ethically as an archaeologist, um, then that that means that I've, I've covered the code of conduct. Um, so an anti-roads archaeologist might work on a, on a road scheme as long as they do a professional job archaeologically. And in theory, that's ethical on behalf of CIFA. But I think these two rules in this slide here are potentially in conflict. Um, public interest might be very much against the development of a church and there might be good archaeological reasons for people to be against the development of a church, for example. Um, but the project will still go ahead and require archaeological input. And this this might put archaeologists in a, in a quite a difficult situation. So Kate and I developed our own ethical framework for our own community work. And we took two main frameworks. The first one is a wellbeing led framework from What Works for Wellbeing, which sets seven criteria. This is all relating to wider data collection, such as the ONS, the National Economic Forum, um, to think about how people on an individual and a communal basis um, consider their well-being. And the second one is about social justice, so empowerment, equality, power dynamics, that kind of thing. So it's traditional and development led project. We're at zero or one. We might be telling people we might be ignoring them and hiding behind the hoarding. Um, gradually, we'd like to aim at least two or three or four. And, and um, I, I'm not sure that five is going to be possible in a development led system, but we'd like to think that it's there's potential to experiment at that level. And so using those frameworks, um, and MOLA have used these concepts generally as well with, with specific um, projects. There's a couple of examples I'm going to show here quickly at the end. Um, the first one is the community producers from Landmark Court in Southwark. Landmark Court is where we found these amazing mosaics um, from, from the Roman period in, in Southwark. Um, and we worked with um, local people, people who live near the, near the site, people who walk past it every day, got the bus past it. Um, it was funded by the client, but not necessarily controlled by the client. So the process was democratic, despite it being on a, on a, on a commercial project. And the six community producers produced their own responses to the archaeology. And they're a really fabulous mix of um, creative and interesting responses to the archaeology. We also commit Kate and I to reimbursing volunteers if they're engaged in consultation or co-creation, whatever it is. If they're spending their time helping us out, then we pay them. We can't pay um, wages because lots of them are on um, benefits and, not, and some of them are refugees or asylum seekers who haven't got the legal status to be able to be paid. So we, we redistribute government funds through shopping tokens and, and things like that. 
this is one of the most radical things I think we've, our sector has done in the last few years, um, not for the reasons that other people thought, but I think the whole idea of archaeology on prescription as run by York Archaeology in York um, over the last few years has been to decenter the archaeology itself and have people as, as, as the main um, component of your project really. So there was archaeology on this site, it wasn't a development led project, um, but nevertheless um, the the people who were engaging in the archaeology and prescription project um, were able to attend when and if they when and if they could, um, and the archaeology was was not the most important part of that project. So for archaeologists to do this, I think was a truly radical act. And then just finally to finish, um, I think that there's lots that we could do internally for our own staff as well. So we need to provide staff with volunteering opportunities in work time. This is a big part of ESG. I know that we're all cynical about it. That and corporate governance. A lot of effort is put into compliance without much interrogation over what or, or or why we're complying with these things. But they can be used as a lever to increase volunteering hours, donations, that kind of thing. Um, I think you should be able to donate from your um, before you pay tax on your wages. There's lots of things like this. And of course, ultimately, it would be really radical if we paid our staff sufficient salaries to enable them to do this kind of um, giving themselves. And then when it comes to project design and management. This is really where it's key um, to embed it from the beginning, really. So we need to be practicing and repeating and experimenting with, with anything, any of the above um, radical ideas that people might have or be able to contribute to our projects. We need to be empowering people through inclusion. So um, not only thinking about outcomes and engagement, it, um, but also about including and listening. And I think it's really, it would be really interesting and important to have a, a recipient of our charity um, on our project teams for some of these projects. So a bit like the community producers, but from the very beginning, so inputting into research aims and agendas and that kind of thing. And I encourage people to ask questions, not because I think we should be knowing our colleagues, but I think we need to ask ourselves all these things. I are, the, the, the projects that I've mentioned um, today, I've been involved in personally, and, and I was involved and I did a, a good job archaeologically. I went home and thought about deeply about why and how I was engaging on those projects as, a, as an archaeologist and also as a, as a person, really, a, a citizen of London. And I think that that's really interesting for us all to be constantly questioning what we're doing and why we're here. Thank you.